This is going to be another short uh, video which is going to look at what sort of games I've been playing over the last couple of weeks since I spoke to you last. Now recently I've posted posted two videos, longer videos, one about um, the different genres of board games that are available, one about the different genres of dice games that are available, but these are slightly longer videos, so I wanted to get back to that short format, and then I'm going to come back uh, hopefully soon with a, a look at card games. But for now, we're going to be looking at what I've been up to over the last couple of weeks in terms of what I've been playing, uh, where I've been going, and, uh, and what sort of uh, experiences I've had in the world of gaming in Wales. So here are a small selection of the games that I've played over the last week or two, uh, some of them more than others, but I've, I've, all of these I've had a good stab at over the last couple of weeks. This one, Kodama, The Tree Spirits, um, has been a particularly delightful um, little find. Now this was, uh, I got this in a trade, I didn't really know what I was getting, it's, it was a maths trade, I'm going to explain what those involve at some point, but basically um, I sent a game off and I got this in return, not knowing a huge amount about it. It turns out that this is really quite beautiful. The artwork was very, very, um, uh, you know, very attractive. And this is the main reason I ended up getting it. It was kind of a sort of um, unseen sort of purchase, you know, just just getting it because it looks so pretty. Um, I'll show you how it works. In Kodama, the tree spirits, each player will take it in turns to select a branch to add to their tree. And these branches will have different symbols on them, whether they be caterpillars or fireflies or flowers. And by forming a continuous sort of chain of cards with those matching symbols, you score points. You'll also have a hand of hidden objectives which tell you that you're going to get extra points for certain um, certain things that you manage to achieve, such as having flowers on the end of your branches or um, you know having having uh, each caterpillar that you have um, will score you extra points. It's a very, very simple game and very, very beautiful. Now these two games over here, Speed Cups and Ringelding, are both Amigo games by Haim Shafir. They're very, very similar games. The rules are almost identical, um, but with a, a very big twist between the two. They work as a sort of pair of games. And as you can see, this one, uh, Speed Cups, says it's for ages six plus, and Ringelding is for four plus. Now I play these with adults, and I play them fairly frequently. I find them enormous fun. I'm gonna show you how they work. Now, Speed Cups is a game where I don't really need to explain the rules. It will be immediately clear to you what's going on. Essentially, I turn over a card and then I arrange the cups exactly as it shows. And I try and do this before all the other players and then I hit the bell. So that would be one point for me, assuming that I managed to complete this card before anyone else and then take the card and score it. So now we're looking at Speed Cups sort of sister game. Ringelding, um, as you can see, a particularly sophisticated game, adult game, all about hair bobbles and putting them on your fingers in various different results. I don't need to explain the rules again because it's exactly the same as Speed Cups. I turn a card over and I try to recreate what's on that card. So let's have a look. I need a pink on there, one of those on there, I need to get a yellow one there, and a blue one there. Now that was particularly slow. I hit the bell when I've done it, and if I've beaten the other players, I scored the point. Downfall of Pompeii. This was a neat find. Now, I, I go to a, um, a board game cafe uh, in Oxford called Thirsty Meeples uh, sometimes. And in Thirsty Meeples, you can try out different games while you're having a cup of coffee, you know, eating some cake. And so it just happened that somebody had mentioned to me about Pompeii, and I thought, oh, that would be an interesting game to play, because uh, I knew there was a game about Pompeii. They were talking about the city themselves and visiting. So we got this one. It's the designer of Carcassonne who made this game, so it's nice and simple and light. And the story is so evocative, and yet the gameplay is super, super simple. I'm going to show you how it works. Downfall Pomp of Pompeii is a game of two halves. So the first half of the game, you're populating the city of Pompeii with these little cylinders which represent the different, um, the different people in the city of Pompeii, completely unaware that the volcano over here could go off at any moment. And so the city gets more and more populated. And the way this is happening is by players having a hand of cards. And each time they play a card, they get to place somebody into the space 
with that, um, that number on it. And so the whole thing gets populated. There's an additional mechanic where I could choose to play a card and if there's already somebody in there, then I get to place an additional one onto a neutral building. And essentially here, I'm trying to get people near to the city gates because I know that um, in the second half of the game, this volcano is gonna go off. Now, when the volcano goes off, um, we're going to change tack. This happens when a certain type of card comes out of the deck, the AD79 card. When that comes out for the second time, we now move to drawing tiles out of this bag and they have lava on them. They get placed on the board according to the symbol in the top corner and gradually they're going to spread out around the board. Meanwhile, these people are going to be moved by the players trying to get to the city gates. But if the lava reaches them before that happens, then those players can be killed or completely cut off from escaping. And so it goes on as tiles are placed, more and more people do their movement. And ultimately, we count how many people have got out of the city. And the person who's got the most people initially into the city and then got them out, that person wins the game. It's a very simple game. It's not much heavier than Carcassonne by the same designer. It's got a lovely, I mean, I say lovely story, it's got a horrific story, but it's a very engaging story, very, um, you know, you, you get very involved with these people and you really want them to escape and you can do these big evil laughs as you pick them up because when you kill them by putting laughter on them, you get to pick them up and drop them in the volcano, which is extremely satisfying. The game plays rather like um, Survive, Escape from Atlantis, that very popular game, but in reverse. Instead of taking tiles off and sinking the city um, while people try to escape, which happens in Atlantis here, we're placing the tiles on and trying to cut people off and, 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 and wipe them out by placing the tiles there. Now, it's a, it's a game that has uh, quite a degree of randomness in it. Um, it's a game where you can predict the winner fairly early. So there, there can be players at the end who are thinking, well, I've got no chance of winning. Um, so, so there are a couple of issues in the game. But the overwhelming sort of theme uh, really uh, makes up for that. And the fact that it's really lightweight, very simple to teach. Nice to be able to teach it in two halves. You teach the first half where we place the things. And then you teach the second half where we actually sort of spread the last out and kill off the people. So Downfall of Pompeii, not a game that's often talked about, but it's been around for a while. It's had a couple of different editions and uh, it really deserves, uh, a, 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 I think, to be better known and also to have a slightly more lavish production than we've got here in the current Mayfair edition. Now Machikoro, this is uh, a, a lovely sort of tinned version, a deluxe edition of Machikoro. Now Machikoro is a city building game um, and it's a really interesting one. You're essentially placing small buildings around, they all have different abilities to generate income or steal income from other players, that sort of thing, but only on a roll on a dice. A bit like in Settlers of Catan, you roll a dice and then everybody's buildings activate and generate um, certain actions for you. Because of the dice rolling, it is a little bit full of luck. And I think without the expansions, it's a bit boring after a few plays because um, there's not much variety in the gameplay. But this deluxe edition includes both the expansions, and yet it's cheaper than buying the base game with a single expansion. So this really is the set to get at the moment, I would say, if you're going to get into Machikoro. And neither expansion adds any great complexity. So this really is a good starting point, aside from the fact that it's very beautiful. So this is Batik. Batik is a, a very simple game whereby a player will take a wooden piece of their own colour and they will drop it into this Perspex box by landing it like this. The next player will then do the same. And then this goes on. And obviously these sort of stack up. Um, so the next player goes like this. And the first player goes again. They go like that. And so the game continues. Now, eventually, someone is going to play a piece in such a way that it sticks out the top, um, the top of the of the container. And at that point, that person loses that round. So let's keep going. Now, this person will play something small because they don't want to be sticking out the top. Now you can see this is just just sticking out the top of the perspex there. Um, so that person would lose, they would lose the piece, 
and then we would reset and continue to play. You can see obviously if they'd put a bigger one in it would be much more obvious that's sticking out the top. And that's the whole game. There's not a huge amount of strategy. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty simple and it's and you know you, you can't it's, it's quite hard to actually get them to land where you want them to land. So this should only really be considered a very quick filler. You know we're talking two minutes per game, if that, and then as you play several rounds, you might get up to 10 minutes for an entire match. There is a bit of a runaway leader problem because as the player loses their pieces, um, their next round gets worse and worse, and ultimately the, the match ends when the player runs out of pieces because th they may have lost so many pieces that they only get halfway up here before they've run out and they can't place anything. At that point, they've lost the match. This game I've spoken to you about before um, when I was talking about my favourite dice games and when I was talking about board game genres, I'm sure Cube Quest will have come up. This is a dexterity game about flicking these cubes, which are essentially dice, uh, and trying to knock the king off the other person's board. <laughs> Finally then, Dixit, which is one of my all-time favourite games. I'm not going to go into great detail about how to play Dixit because uh, I suspect a lot of people are familiar with it. But what I found interesting this week is revisiting an old variant that was placed onto Board Game Geek a few years ago um, by one of the, the one of the users. Um, his username is uh, Storm Knight. Now he's come up with a two-player variant for Dixit. In two-player cooperative Dixit, um, Storm Knight's variant from Board Game Geek, each player has a hand of cards, the same as they would in the normal game. Um, so each card obviously has one of the sort of beautiful images that you normally expect to see in Dixit. And the player chooses one of their cards and gives it a name. So for example, I'm going to call this card um, a nice knight for a walk. Okay, so the player places this face down and then the other player who is their teammate looks at their own set of cards and they try and choose a card which they could also call a nice night for a walk. So maybe this one would be quite a good one, a nice night for a walk. So they put that one on the pile. Now what the two players are trying to do is get um, the, the, the person who comes up with the clue wants the other person to guess their card correctly and they and then the person who is choosing the second card wants the original clue giver to choose to select the right card they want to both choose each other's cards but the problem here is that four cards are now added randomly from the deck and these are shuffled in to create a pile of cards and then they're laid out exactly as they would be in regular um, Dixit and numbered from one to six. Each player then uses their, their voting tokens to choose which one they think of these different images was called a nice night for a walk. So we have a lot of different sort of spooky images along here. And so if let's say uh, one player says, right, well it is number, um, number one, and the other player thinks, yeah, I think it probably is number two. And so they reveal the two of them. And of course, in this instance, they've got it right because these were the two cards chosen by the team. So the white rabbit advances one. If either of them had got it wrong, then the black rabbit would have advanced by one instead. And you play to a set total, I would suggest about 10 or 15 points. For once a rabbit gets there, then you've either won if it's the white rabbit that gets there or lost if it's the black rabbit. Now it's a particularly difficult game, this as cooperative, and it's not as much fun as the regular Dixit, but it's a really good way to try out Dixit. Um, and if you haven't got a whole sort of party and you really feel like playing it, it's a good way of sort of practicing coming up with those clues. Um, it is fun and you can vary the difficulty level by instead of putting out four random cards from the deck you could put out three or you could increase the difficulty level by going up to seven you know by putting in five extra cards it, it's um, it's very sort of malleable like that so it's a good variant um, and you know it's it's another way to play Dixit. So those are some of the games that I've been playing over the last couple of weeks. 
I wanted to mention about a, uh, an event that happened in Cardiff, in Wales, um, last weekend, which was for the International Tabletop Day, uh, which is Geek and Sundry, the, the, the YouTube channel. They, they, they promote these events and, and, and stores will sign up to, to join in with these events. Now, I've been going for the last few years to various different Tabletop Day events, but what happened in Cardiff this weekend was something quite extraordinary, almost uh, sort of convention size, I would say. So, a large hotel in the centre of Cardiff city centre was taken over by um, Rules of Play, the local game shop in Cardiff, and there were around 400 people in attendance, several different side rooms, one massive room, publishers um, with displays, people showing off their, uh, their designs, their prototypes, people selling their games, um, several designers in attendance, you know, designer of Hive, and people, people selling the, the tables, as, as, as you've seen in my video, I have a Geek and Sun table, so Geek and Sun, Sun is a, a manufacturer of sort of high quality wooden gaming tables. So they were showing off their tables. It was a tremendous event and, and a huge success. So uh, I think everybody in Cardiff is kind of hoping that we're going to build over the next year or two into something really quite large. Uh, we're not, uh, you know, we're not quite rivaling the UK Games Expo that's coming up in Birmingham uh, in, in a few weeks time. But this, this was something and it shows that there is uh, scope, I think, for large conventions around the UK, not just uh, not just this one central convention in Birmingham. Um, so that was tremendous. The other thing that I've been doing over the last week or so is is communicating quite communicating quite a lot with publishers about um, my my own designs. I, I design games with a local playtest group, so we're part of a wide network called Playtest UK, and they have various different groups around the UK. Ours is the Cardiff group, and we meet once a week. We play each other's designs, play each other's prototypes, and give each other feedback. As a result of this group, I've now got to the point where one of my games will be published later in the year, coming out at Essen, and others sitting with various other publishers with, with a hope for um, future publication, and, and some looking likely, some looking less likely. Um, but this week, I've, I've managed to have the opportunity to pitch designs to publishers. I've been communicating quite a lot with the publishers who have been designing who, who, who are uh, producing my, my game and, and that's been very enjoyable looking at rules tweaks seeing how the publishers view it seeing how I view it and then seeing if we can marry those two things it's been a very friendly creative sort of approach and I've really enjoyed that um, and it's been nice to have the opportunity to pitch again you know when it's not that often you get an opportunity to pitch to publishers because you've got to somehow get in front of them face to face and that can only happen at events really um, and, and then over the coming months you might get games rejected um, and, and so you can feel a bit downtrodden at times. So actually getting your games in front of a publisher and seeing a really positive response really lifts you again and, 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 and makes you um, want to get you know, down to work and really work on honing those games again. So I'm in a, a bit of a design mode at the moment and I think I will be probably for the next few weeks until the expo uh, where hopefully I can, I can you know, sit down in front of some publishers again and show them what I've got. So, 
That's what I've been up to the last few weeks. I hope there was something interesting or informative in there for you. Um, and I hope that you'll watch more of these videos over the coming weeks. I'm going to try and keep them fairly regular um, and see if we can sort of find a, a, a way forward for this new direction with the channel. So thank you for watching and all the best. Thank <laughs> you.